Welcome everyone to the GoWP Digital Agency Owners Podcast, where we interrogate our colleagues in the WordPress community to find out the truth of their talents and tricks of their trade. I'm Mariah Origa, GoWP's Director of Creative Services. And I'm Joanne Torres. I am WP's marketing manager. And before we get started, I would like to say a couple of words about GoWP in case anyone isn't fully familiar with us. At GoWP, we create happiness for digital agencies and help them become more profitable, whether it's joining in our super valuable weekly happiness hour calls, or if you're just looking to grow your team with a developer, a copywriter, a designer, or a project manager, we got you covered. We also have services like case study services, blogging, website maintenance, content edits, or page builds. So you can completely outsource that to our team. So Joanne, would you be so kind as to tell the listeners where they can learn more about GoWP and our helpful services? Absolutely. They can go to GoWP.com or any of our social media channels. So GoWP support on Twitter and go WP everywhere else. So Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Yeah, sign up anywhere there and get all of the updates of what's going on. And now let's take it away to welcome our guest, Mario. Right. Today's guest <laughs> is actually more than a friend and partner of GoWP. He's kind of like our uncle. He's our wise uncle, you know, who always wants to know... <laughs> <laughs> where you're, where you've applied to college, or if you're getting the best savings rates, uh, the very learned uncle. Chris Lemma is the general manager of Learn Dash at Liquid Web, but we all know he know he does so much more. He's a mm. blogger, public speaker, author, product strategist, and business coach. His Amazon author profile says he helps companies leverage WordPress and helps WordPress companies find leverage. For more than 20 years, Chris has developed and managed high-performing teams to build software products, particularly SaaS products in a variety of B2B vertical markets. So in layman's terms, he helps great teams create even greater products. He's even spent the last 10 years coaching startups on product development and marketing strategies. But of all of his skills and titles, my personal favorite is Chris Lemma, the quintessential writer and storyteller. And if you've ever worked with him, you know that he's the master of story and frameworks. And I think that's where we'll start today with frameworks. And welcome, welcome, Chris. Welcome. It's great to be here. That was a super long intro. Wow. <laughs> was it? I'm like, that's a lot of stuff. And I also, I'm like, I think I need to go back and update some of those pieces, but <laughs> all good. We like to be thorough. Like yeah. To... Yeah. You went lots of places to pull that together. <laughs> you lived a long life, my yes. friend. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> and we're glad that your life has brought you here with us this morning. Thank I am you. thrilled to be here. <laughs> so yeah, I, I thought we'd start talking about what a lot of us know you best for is your instruction and your frameworks, but I wanted to frame this discussion. There was a film that I actually don't think I've really ever seen in its entirety. It's from the 90s. It's a Gwyneth uh, Paltrow film. Don't even know who the co-star is, but it's, so the film is Sliding Doors. I and love that movie. Have you seen it? Okay. So you correct me oh. if I'm wrong on the plot because I really, I've seen parts of it but I don't think I've seen it all. But, you know, essentially it examines, you know, what, what parallel twists and turns our lives could all take just based on one choice, one different choice, yeah. how our fates can change. And if our fate is even something that one can change. And so there, you know, when we look at you and, you know, that long intro that I did, as you referenced <laughs> and teased me about, one of the things that remains constant is that element of storytelling. And if, if you look at different careers, lots of other careers have frameworks and storytelling at their heart as well. So I'm just curious, is there a parallel world? If, we're, if we are on the, the set of sliding doors and they're, and they're writing the script now, is there a parallel world where Chris Lemma isn't all of those amazing things that I just listed, but he's instead Pastor Chris or tenured Professor Lemma or any other similar careers that you considered in your oh. early days? Yeah. So actually, you know, when you talk to, and it's less these days because there's less singers and there's more like how they construct a, a musical artist, but in the old days, right? In the eighties and nineties, which is not really old, but in the eighties and nineties and before that, when you met someone who was a, a famous musician, a vocalist, right? You talk to Whitney Houston and you interview her and you say, how'd you get your start? She would be like, well, I sang in church. 
right? And you talk to someone else and they're like, oh, I sang in church. And right, like there was this whole series of vocalists, right? Vocal artists who became famous in the pop scene, in the song, singer songwriter space, who when you went backwards and you asked them, they said, well, I, I sang in church. And the reason is because they didn't let five and six and eight year olds sing at a bar, right? Or sing anywhere else. Like the, the place where you could sing every Sunday was church. And for me telling stories, I, I could speak at a school function. I, I think, you know, one of the first times I spoke in front of people, I was like six or seven and it was a school board meeting and I was one of the speakers, right? But at school itself, right? There would be moments to speak and, and you get opportunities to speak for the valedictorian thing or the graduation thing, or right? Like you'd, you'd raise your hand at different moments to speak. But the place where I spoke the most, right? After uh, high school, while I was in college and after college was in church, I would write sermons and I'd say four fifths of the sermons I wrote, other pastors would preach, right? I wrote them and then I would go, here's the curriculum for the six weeks. And we'd go, here's the six speak, you know, the, the, the six talks and they would tweak them and make them their own. I, I, I don't take anything away from them, but their gift and my gift mix might've been more focused on caring for people, whatever. It wasn't necessarily public speaking. And I would craft the stories and be like, oh, and I would write for different pastors, which meant the tone of voice, the word use, how you approach a story for one person might be different from another. In my head, I would say, this is kind of like the writers at SNL, right? They may never be seen. They may never, you know, whatever, but then they had to write the jokes or the skits. So I wrote a lot of sermons and I would get on stage probably once every four or five weeks. And so when you do that over years, you get a lot of experience mm -hmm. interacting with audiences, right? And so it wouldn't be hard in my head to imagine being a pastor. I, I, I decided pretty early on, right, that while I loved volunteering in that capacity, that the same skills that I had used in a church and the same skills I had used at the YMCA paid more in software. <laughs> and so I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to go that way. In this world, but in this life, Chris, it pays In this more. life, because sliding doors, there's somewhere else where I'm sitting in a church. And then what I told my wife was, hey, when I get done with this whole thing, right, when I'm done working with software companies and all that, I already have a master's degree. I'm like, maybe I go back and get a PhD or maybe they'll let me just do with a master's degree, be a lecturer on a college campus, right? A lecturer, get to hang out with young kids and get to speak and, and all that. So I think you nailed it. I think the two options that you brought up are exactly the ones that have been uh, top of mind. I think the software world when I started, which was like 94, I didn't know that software would eat the world or take over everything in 94. I thought, well, I'll run at this for a little bit and then we'll see what happens next. And it just turns out software hasn't ever stopped and it's taken over everything. And so my background and my experience has been aligned with the way the world has moved. Well, roll credits. <laughs> like that's that's the way that story was written that's that's yeah. amazing and it's interesting to think that so you were a bona fide youth pastor in a sense you said I was a I was a high I was a volunteer high school pastor I was a volunteer college pastor so I spoke on at, at UC Berkeley as part of their university and spoke there several times over uh -huh. and then I was a volunteer teaching pastor in two or three different church plants mostly non non-denominational so you get the the kind of broadest storytelling applicability because it, it, these were like you know 30 minute sermons and 20 minutes of music, you know, it's, it's a talk and a rock concert and you whip them up together and you're like, great, I'll write the stuff. And then I'll ask for this song to lead into me, or I'll ask for this song to lead out and let's go put on a production. Right. That, that, that's awesome. Witness, do not be able to help someone that had an agency challenge, but if that moment ever comes, you can always pray for them. If there's yes, something that's right. can, that's exactly right. can't help you, but there's the Lord. Right here. One of the, you even talking about the people that are behind the scenes, even the GoWP team members that you don't get to interact with, you know, often, if at all, that you, that you never see, they know your name well, they know the frameworks. The one that's most popular uh, among our team is the bridge framework. In fact, when you get hired with uh, GoWP, that's assigned reading from the very beginning. So for the listeners that aren't familiar with the bridge framework, what it is and how you use it as an instructional for companies that you work with, can you 
just describe it, explain just, it, just, you know, a quick just give away, just yeah, give away, give all away my everything that you're paying give away for. All <laughs> my secrets that people pay for, give it for free. Yes, mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. you and only for you. Thank we'll you. time you. It has to be yeah. a 90 second. Yeah, 90 um, seconds. Let me let me pull up the timer. And when I say go. Oh my gosh, we're gonna time me. That's <laughs> that's that's even harder. Just so that's you don't give it all fun. away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are are you comfortable with that? Yeah, here we go. All right. Tell me when you're ready. Okay, let me pull up 90 seconds. Oh, I, no, not 90 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. Oh, goodness. These, okay. But people can purchase Chris's explanation of the framework for 90 minutes. Just go to his website and you can. 100%. <laughs> All right. And 90 seconds. One, two, three, go. All right, the bridge framework is a way that helps people understand how to shape their narrative. Most of us have a product. And when we go to sell that product, we start with looking from the inside out. We're like, hey, here's my product. How do I share it to you? And that's the wrong way to do it. People will like your why, they'll like your motivation, you know, when they have time for it, but most people don't have time for it. They are stuck at a river. They are stuck trying to get across the river. They have likely already tried to get over the river. They've tried to walk across, swim across. They've tried to pay someone they can take them on a boat across. And in every way it's failed. And when you connect with their pain, when you understand where they've been and you're standing on the other side of the river bank going, hey, I'm not better than you. I'm not smarter than you, but I know how to get across this river. It's out of the way, but there's a bridge. And if you go a mile down the river, You'll get to the bridge, you can cross it. And if you're trying to head up to the store at the top of the hill, I'll wait for you. And what we do is we highlight destination. People don't wake up saying, I want a bridge. They wake up understanding they want to get somewhere, the top of the hill, the store that's there. People have a destination. People have a strategy or route of how to get there. And then people face encumbrances, challenges, pains, and frustrations. And when they do, that's when we can stand there and say, I'm not better than you, I'm not smarter than you, but I know how to get across the bridge. I know where to find it and how to get across it. And when we put our product in that position, then we can help people get to where they're trying to go. He that was it. perfect. <laughs> it I think, was. I think I that was what in my inner monologue, 85, 87 seconds. Something no, like your sense of timing, honestly, I'm shocked. It's incredible, impeccable. And not only that, for a moment there, I felt like I was watching a YouTube video that's just like two, at two X <laughs> at two times fast. Yeah, that was awesome. And I just want to reiterate that about the bridge framework, it has helped us just make better decisions in terms of building webinars, landing pages that convert. And overall, it informs our messaging in such a, a powerful way. So if anyone is looking for a framework to accurately tell a story and get people to convert essentially, or to sign up to whatever it is that you're selling, the bridge framework is excellent. And, and you had a little taste of what that is. Obviously <laughs> that was, yeah, that was awesome. Normally, Thank you normally, so much. I, normally I use more minutes, but <laughs> I, when I tell people, when I tell public speakers, right, when I'm, mm. when I'm talking to them, I'm like, listen, you may have prepared 45 minutes. I have been in the situation over and over again, when I'm walking to the stage where someone says, hey, we're running a little late. Can you shave five minutes off? Can you shave 10 minutes off, right? And they're not asking you to do less of what you were paid to do or what you've been asked to do. They're just asking you to do it in less time. Mm -hmm. They don't feel like they're saying, hey, by the way, take your major point and throw it away. They're just saying, I, I need to compress it. And so one of the ways you structure your content is so that you can go, oh, I can take this story out and it still delivers the value. And so you have to be ready, right? To tell whatever story you're telling. Can you do it in two minutes? Can you do it in five minutes? Can you do it in 10 minutes? Can you do it in 20 minutes? Can you do it in 40 minutes? And what I'll tell you is doing it in five minutes or 10 minutes is way harder than 40. You got all the time in the world, right? So 90 seconds, yeah, that's a little extreme, but you have to be prepared to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful segue to the next point that I wanted to explore with you. Uh, one of the first blog articles I think I wrote for GoWP was about creating the perfect elevator speech. And it was our pitch. And it was based off of a conversation that you and Jennifer Bourne, maybe a third, I know I quoted Robert Jacoby also from Cloudways in that article too. But it was that information that you shared with other agency owners during the GoWP happiness hour about 
taking advantage of those moments when maybe not necessarily when you are public speaking or perhaps, but when you have a captive audience, a potential client, and you want to connect with them and you want to engage, but you don't want to over pitch who you are or what you do. And I feel like the bridge framework, especially for those agency owners who are out there who recognize the importance of networking and speaking and presenting, but hate public speaking and networking. I think the bridge framework is the perfect anchor for someone like that. But I know that you've also advised that when to use the bridge framework in relations with clients or potential clients, you don't want to pitch the bridge itself and you don't want to pitch too soon. Do you have, I don't know if that's a clear question, but is there a way that you, for someone who's like, yeah, the bridge, that's a great idea. I'd like to use that. I'd like to incorporate it, but how can you tell them how they can use it effectively? So if you were to take a stopwatch and clock how much time I spent describing the bridge in that 90 seconds that we did, right? Or 87 seconds, whatever it was, right? In that 90 seconds that we did, you will notice that I barely spent any time on the bridge, right? I think I said, you, the bridge is out of the way and you can get to it and you can cross it. And I said, the bridge is your product and no one wakes up thinking they want the bridge, right? Those are the three times I mentioned bridge. And in those three times, it was a femtosecond, right? So when you add it all up, you're like, out of 90 seconds, he talked about the bridge three seconds. The bridge framework spends most of its time talking about pain, talking about challenge, talking about how you tried to get across the river. I tried to walk across, the water got to here. I tried to swim across and it moved too fast. I tried to pay guy my last 10 bucks and he took off on the boat and I never got across. We use these examples and we spend time agitating the pain so that someone feels like we see them, that we get them. And then standing on the other side of the bridge saying, hey, I'm not better than you, I'm not smarter than you. They're like, I'm willing to listen because you see me. Most of the time we think marketing is the effort to be seen. Right? We think of marketing in the paradigm of, I got to get the world to see me and see my product and see my offering. And if you're an agency owner, you spend all your time figuring out how to pitch yourself so people can see you. And that's the exact opposite of what you need to do. Real, solid, effective marketing is about highlighting that you see them. You see the prospect, that the prospect feels seen because then the prospect will more willingly and more easily approach you because you see them compared to all the other vendors who are so busy pointing at themselves, right? That no one got seen. So if I'm in a uh, bar or I'm at a conference in the, the network track, if I'm in a hallway, it doesn't matter where I am or an elevator. I want to spend time on the pain. I want to spend time on the river and the roadblocks because then people will say, oh my gosh, you've been where I've been. Like you get me and then they will ask more questions. We've all been in the situation where you say, hey, what do you do? And they're like, I sell insurance or I'm a travel guide or uh, I'm a business coach. Doesn't matter what the answer, but it's so flat. It's so boring, right? Uh, that you're like, I don't really have a second question to ask you. We've all been in those situations where they go on and on about themselves. And you're like, I don't even remember what question I asked you, but now I'm figuring out how to get out of here, right? But imagine if you said, someone's like, oh, what do you do? Well, I built this particular set of strategies for million dollar membership sites, membership sites that are earning a million dollars or more. And they have a unique set of problems. And I built some strategies to help them grow. Well, tell me more about that. Do those strategies work for someone who isn't a membership site? What if I have an e-commerce site? What if I have this? Wait, it has to be a million. What if it's half a million? Or are there strategies that work for millionaires, million dollar membership sites that work for million dollar e-commerce sites? Right? Like you want to tease the fact that, yeah, you know where the bridge is. And the bridge, you don't want to sell the bridge to people standing right in front of the bridge. You want to sell the bridge when the bridge is a mile off scene so you can't see it. And then you're like, yeah, I know how to get there, right? I, I know where it is and I can tell you how to use it. And so when you're doing that elevator pitch, right? Can you help someone else feel like you get their world, right? You feel like you see them and you understand their problems. And so it means that your model may change, right? If I get introduced to five different people at a party and each of them do something different, my intro of what I do will likely be different for each one of them, right? Because what I'm trying to do is figure out how to connect my story to their story rather than just repeating my line over and over, hoping that someone will find it entertaining. Awesome. Awesome explanation. No, no more questions, Your Honor. <laughs> no follow-ups on that. No follow-up. Okay. The defense rests. I don't know. That's great. 
Well, okay. That was it's so fascinating. I have so many questions around how you curate experiences, but we'll talk about that a little bit further down the line because I'm very fascinated by how, now that you just said that your pitch will be different for each kind of person that you meet. And I've seen that pattern in, in many places. So I will talk about that a little bit further uh, down the line. But right now we want to focus on your influences, like taking a couple of steps back before just getting to the, the past Chris Lemma, before we got the Chris Lemma we know now. So we did a little snooping on your LinkedIn page and we see you follow a couple of leaders such as Bill Gates, which is not really su surprising <laughs> if you're in the tech world. We've heard you reference stand-up comedians, late night talk shows, and a wide range of leaders, which to us, we, we're very into the culture, pop culture. So that really resonates with us. So what person alive or dead would you be surprised to learn influences you and what specifically do they teach you? So someone alive or dead who you would be surprised mm -hmm. has influenced me. Mm -hmm. His name is Lewis James Lipton. He was the interviewer of a TV show. He was also the dean of the Actors Studio Drama School, but he was a interviewer on Inside the Actors Studio. It was a show. And he was inspired by Bernard Pivo, he would tell you every time, because he had at the end of his interview, he would ask these questions. But he had all these students in the room and he would invite an actor, a, a well-known actor that you knew, right? And he'd sit there and he'd just ask him questions. And the thing I loved most about it was, man, had he done his research, right? Like when you said, we did our research, I start shaking. Cause I'm like, oh my God, if you ask me who Mrs. Abel is and, and how she had an impact on me, I'm gonna be toast. Cause I'm gonna, oh my God, I'm gonna start crying. Cause that's what he would do. He'd be like, so Chris, what was it about Mrs. Abel that changed your life? And I'm like, oh my God, that was my fifth grade teacher. How do you know that? How did you know, right? And she, and, and then Mrs. Sharp. And, the, and so you're like, what? But he had all this research and he would, he would probe in, right? And ask these questions. But even as he was interviewing someone, right? He knew the right places to really dig in and say, why? Right? Right at this moment where you're like, so then I chose this movie. And, and you think the actor is on his way to telling one story and Lipton would cut in and be like, what? So I, I picked this movie and I'm like, why? And Clint Eastwood is not ready for the why question because Clint Eastwood's about to tell you some reason about the story about the movie. And then he's like, what? And then he's like, well, actually the reason I chose to do that movie was because of da, da, da. And that's a way more interesting interview than the, the standard story Clint's going to tell everybody else, right? So I watched every single episode. And I kept going, you know, like inside the actor studio is the best TV on the planet, right? I got to watch it, right? And so he definitely impacted how I thought about engaging other people, thought about conversations and interviews. I, I have in the years since I first watched the show, I've done lots of watching, right? Paying attention to to people and what and what they do and how they do it in the space that I'm in. And so eventually I will show up to someone and I will say, hey, it's great to meet you. My name's good. They're like, I know who you are. I'm like, well, I just want to know, I just want you to know, I know who you are. In fact, you gave a talk five years ago in Chicago. You had this slide. It was a little kid holding the fist, right? And I was, you know, it was one of those memes, but you open it and you talk about the hospital. And this guy who we've never physically met is like, are you kidding me? You were in that audience? You watched that? Like, you've known who I am for five years? Oh yeah. And then you did this and then you did it. And I think there is nothing more respectful, nothing that gives someone a, a, a stronger sense of being seen than when you can articulate the fact that you have been watching, that you've been paying attention, that you know who they are. And in the business of helping people, other people see others, right? I think Lipton, you know, is a model and one of the best. So that's that long answer to that very short question. But I, I love the question because it's a great opportunity to talk about James Lipton. And he is dead. I didn't realize this, right? But he died in the middle of uh, 2020. And so I was talking about Lipton last year to someone. And I'm like, I wonder what he's up to now. And I'm like, oh, nothing, right? Nothing. And I'm like, oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, he was a great one for sure. Just a quick follow-up question. Is it 
because of empathy? Is it because of the business we're in? Why are you so fascinated by digging? Well, I will tell you, I, you know, and you, you know this already, right? For me, everything is about story. I don't build product without story. I don't do marketing without story. I don't build a team without story. If you want to know how Pepsi started fighting against Coca-Cola, or you want to know how Avis sat in second place and got their entire team mobilized to do well, it's story. If you want to talk about, you know, how hotels motivate their staff or Disneyland motivates their staff at every shift turnover, it's story, right? Narrative sits at the core of everything. And so for me, watching a master who knows how to pull out the best stories from people is far none the best. That's, that's why I lived at the top of my list. But you also happen to be really you have funny. Do you think humor is a necessarily skill for, for effective storytelling or is that just yes. more in a... Yeah, I, I think so. I think, I think some of the most interesting and influential comedians can make you laugh even in the middle of telling you a really painful story. And it's interesting how they do that, right? Like you're digging through the craft. It's not, I mean, I watched a comedian in DC years ago where every line was a punchline. I had never seen that done before, right? Hmm. He said something, we laughed. He said the follow-up, we laughed again. He said the follow-up, he laughed. But he wasn't telling a story. He was literally just throwing one line after another. And he had crafted this routine that was 127 laugh lines and they it was funny like he did a really good job but that's not my normal comedy right I like listening to someone who's going to walk through and tell a story what what we try to do here in the lemma house right what I I try and do all the time is what we call closing the loop or bring it back around right so you make a joke or you make a comment about someone or you take a jab right whatever I say something that is sarcastic and mean to my daughter at the top of this thing and we're having this discussion and then can you bring it back around, right? Can you use the same line you open with to close with? It's what, you know, some of the best comedians do. And, and I try and do it all the time, right? Because it helps close the loop. It helps define beginning and end, right? When you go to improv school, which I've never been to, but when you go to improv school, what you learn is that where you close off the skit is what makes the thing funny or not, right? Mm -hmm. And so learning, right? That was enough. That was good. Chop right there, right? Editing is the hallmark of making something good and funny. So I think humor is a big part of it. I think humor on its own is like that guy with 127 laugh lines. You can take it or leave it. Humor in service of the narrative, humor connected in then becomes really powerful, right? Because there's some stories and some things that are so hard to talk about that if you don't bring a line of humor in the middle of it, if you don't connect up and close the loops later, people just, people just don't know okay, like, what do I do with this, right? We, we started at the top of the show talking about um, the context of when I was a, a teaching pastor. When I was finishing up, when I was moving on and just becoming a regular member in a church, we had a young man who was one of the youth pastors give a, give a talk, right? It was a Sunday night. I will never forget it. My wife will never forget it. We will joke about it for the rest of our lives because he started on a down note. Like, this is the night that my girlfriend broke up with me. And then for the next 47 minutes, way too long for a sermon, it just got worse and worse and worse. His girlfriend broke up with him to be with his best friend. And then his mom, you know, left the house and then he ran out of power in the house. Like it just, and the whole time, the public speaker in me and the community in me is like, where are you going? Like there is like, unless an angel from heaven shows up and says, fear not, right? Like this story is dead. Like, and the, uh, the entire audience, the congregation was like, we're done with, right? Like, how do we get out of this room? It was horrible. And then of course, at the end, he's like, how'd I do? And I'm like, well, there's nowhere to go but up, right? But like, even if you're trying to make a point out of something serious or, or hard, you got to edit, you got to get to it and get done, but you also need to bring a little bit of humor so that we have that release moment, relax moment, that ah, breath in the space. Cause if you just keep going downhill, eventually you're just like, Oh God, get me out. How do I leave? Right. Absolutely. And you're right. The, the great comedians, they nail the callbacks and they, they know when to end um, their routines. And you as an audience member, you look back and you're like, 
I can't believe this journey you just took me on, you know, yeah. and you yeah. hit me with some deep stuff, but I laughed along. Yeah. The greats yeah. do it well, do it excellent. Yeah. What, speaking of narrative and humor, I guess we've been through a lot as a nation and a world the last two years and finding it's been a strong narrative and we struggle to find the bright spots and the humor, but there has been many people have made discoveries about themselves and their careers during this time and a lot of time for self-reflection. One of the topics that I'm really fascinated in is the great resignation and all of the conversations around that topic. What is the cost? What is it really? Why are people leaving? Where are their jobs? Where are they going? There are a lot of theories out there, but I, I just read an economist's article a few days ago. I've forgotten the exact numbers, but the millions of workers out there that we as a nation have to coax back into the workplace and, and the strategy to get there. But recently, on another podcast by James Laws, who you said is a friend of yours, you both were speaking about the great resignation and something that you said caught my attention. You were saying, Chris, that a, there's a segment of people leaving their current jobs or leaving the workforce altogether because they feel unfulfilled in their current position, partly because they don't see the purpose and value that they are bringing to their company. I, I think one of the lines you said <laughs> is that they think if a monkey could do what they do, and still get the accolades, what's the point in them doing it, right? And recently, well, I guess a few months ago, you worked with a few members on our team to develop rubrics for the new teams that we've been hiring. And, and then you and I and Brad explored that again about a week ago, two weeks ago. My rubric is not good. <laughs> As you know, it's funny. That's been a really tough exercise for me, but very eye-opening and about the way I was looking at what a rubric is and how I maybe was looking at it wrong. My only experience with rubrics in a professional sense was when I was a teaching artist in a classroom with young students and writing. And it was, you know, there was a different, that was a different environment and you're just preparing them to write well for their fourth grade, you know, yeah. write state writing test. Exactly. When, well, when it comes to professional teams, I realized it can really be a great tool as an agency owner to say, is my team, are they still checked in? Are they still motivated? But instead of the way I was looking at it on a one to five scale, all of my team has to get to five. If we don't all get to fives, our department is sunk. We're not doing, I'm not doing what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to do as a manager, getting, showing my team members the pathway to score the five. And you showed me that's the wrong way to think about a rubric. Can you address that? You can talk about it much more eloquently than I can. Well, I, I think the goal of a rubric is to del deliver value on both sides of, of the coin, right? So the employee who's being shown the rubric and the leader who is using the rubric, you want both people to benefit from it, right? If it's only for the employee, then they're going to think the same way that you thought, which is, I got to get to five. Like, I only get paid the most if I get to five. And you're like, no, 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 no. You know, I'm going to design the rubric so that everybody is doing well at a three, right? If you go to a four, as a leader, I should be thinking about, oh, they're pushing past the confines of this role. They're moving above and beyond. And that's going to mean if I don't put them in a new role that has an, another new level three, right, they're going to get bored. Most companies lose fours and fives. If we score everybody on a one to five and we say three is delivering value that the job was designed to deliver, right? Companies lose fours and fives. Ones and twos never leave. They're like, ha ha, you're paying me. I'm not going anywhere, right? But ones and twos never leave. Threes, right, are happy until they have to spend their entire job with ones and twos, in which case they're like, what am I doing here, right? If that guy, that bozo is making the same money I'm making and I'm doing all of my work and all of theirs, I should leave. But for the most part, ones and twos don't leave. Threes is where you want to keep them. What you got to be worried about is the fours and fives, right? Because the fours and fives, they bring particular talents to the scenario, and then you're not leveraging it. And when you first brought a four or five, when you first brought them in the job and they had to use those skills to set up systems or do things, they were thrilled because they were fulfilled because they were doing things that no one else could do. And you recognize it, they recognize it, we're all happy. But then the job became more of a keep it moving, keep it going, keep the trains on tracks. That's a three. And that's no problem, except your fours and fives are like, that's not for me, I'm bored. So what do they do? 
They go get a job somewhere else. And you come alongside as a leader and you pat them on the back and you give them an award and you stand in front of a group of people. And you're like, he wrote a memo that had full sentences. And you're like, are you serious? Like you, you're like that. How is that the award? Right. And so fours and fives feel unfulfilled in that context. Fours and fives will leave, right? They'll find another place, another challenge. I, I have worked at LiquidWeb for five years and I started as a VP of product where we had no product, nothing for managed WordPress, nothing for managed WooCommerce. I designed those products. I developed those products. I built the teams to craft those products and I shaped how we took them to market. Then we bought a company called Nexus. We had to move the products over to Nexus and I helped us think through what are the next features that a Nexus product line could bring for managed WooCommerce. We did uh, performance uh, monitoring and we did automated acceptance tests. It's great. And then we were slowing down and we were going to go do something else that didn't really require me. And so I'm sitting there going, I don't know, is it my time? Is it time to go? Is it time to move on? Thankfully, the leadership there was like, well, wait, let's get you buying companies. We know you can add value here. And so we went and bought a whole bunch of companies. And the last one we bought, LearnDash, they were like, do you have a, a course and educator background. Do you want to run we, we may not have bought LearnDash if I wasn't in the room because we had someone to, to lead it. And I went, yeah, new challenge, new problems, new stuff. Of course, the moment I took it, they're like, hey, what about this? What about this? Are we going to fix this? To that? And, and you would think, why, why are you jumping on? But that's the best part of my day where you're like, oh, you have challenges? Because after some months, right, I get on a call with my boss. He goes, you know what we should do? We should look at it. I go, I already did. Here it is. Here's the data. Here's it. Oh, he's like, yeah, I, I, I should have known, right? You're on it. Fours and fives, right? Need management to keep challenging them. So yes, it's important in a rubric to show people, here's what it would take to get to four or five. Don't make a black box. Don't make it like, oh, the only way you can get into those levels is if you're my favorite. And if you're not my favorite, then there's no way to do it, right? That's the bias we see in most orgs. And you don't want to do that. You want to be transparent. These are the skills and it's binary and you either do it or don't. And now you're a four or you're five. But the moment we realize that our employees are getting to fours and fives, we got to go change the role and push them back down to a two or three, Right. And I put people that are fours and fives and they've gotten really comfortable being a four. I put them in a new role where there are two and they're like, I hate this. And I go, really hate this? Or like only just kind of a little bit hate it. And they're like, no, 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 I'll figure it out. I'm like, okay, that's what I thought. And then there are three. And then there are four again, right? Because high achievers, high performers are constantly pushing to get back to high performance. Our job as leaders, right, is to create the context where they can thrive. And if you don't do that, then they'll move on. Right. They'll talk with their feet. I think I, I yep. they'll read vote. You. They'll vote with their feet. <laughs> and that was a lesson for me that it's not static. And as you know, as I work with our team members, it's a, how can I challenge them? And so yep. that was a great lesson. Thank you again for helping me with the rubric. That's still a work in progress. We have had, you know, when we also talk about motivation, the agency owners are also part of this consideration. Yep. One of the topics that comes up frequently in these podcast interviews and on the, the information that we get from new members to the digital agency owners group, we have agency owners who are like, I want to niche down. I don't know how to do it. And I think we were talking to Kronda Adair a few weeks ago, and she talked about the early days of her agency and it taking her five years to niche down, to know how to do it in the way that was right for her. So um, do you have any insight for how an agency can pare down, can niche to do it in a way that's profitable for them, but also that's fulfilling for them and what their goals are as an owner. Yeah. I mean, I think it does take a lot of work. I don't know that it has to take five years, but it isn't going to happen in five days. It takes work because you're not just randomly picking a niche and saying, I'm going to focus on this. What you're really doing is looking at your customer base and breaking them apart into lots of different segments and then understanding what was it about this segment that your business and your personality and your value system, what made this alignment happen? And if you were to take, you know, all your customers and break them out into small segments, you would find that there's a couple segments that are more populated than others, right? That you have more customers in a segment than others. And when you do that, you'll start asking, well, why? Right? Why is it that you know hotel owners 
seem to get what I'm talking about better than others? Or why is it that startups, tech, software, SaaS startup owners seem to get what I'm talking about better than others? Or why is it that nonprofits that are missional in nature seem to understand what I'm talking about better than others? And you'll discover it's not just your words. It's not just your message. It's your message. It's how you price. It's how you position. It's how you articulate goals. It's how you set up projects. All those things have an alignment to a micro segment better than others. So then you get to ask yourself, well, are there other micro segments that value all these pieces too? And you'll find two or three and you go, great, let's niche down into these two or three and use our messaging and use our approach. I know people who say, I won't take a down payment. I will just start on a monthly basis. And here's why I do that. I have this conviction. I've worked in this other, on that side of the table and blah, 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 blah. And there are others who are like, you don't pay me 50%. We're not starting this project. So you have two people who do maybe the same thing. We both build websites and they, they run agencies and they work with a lot of different customers and similar customer base. And they have two different value systems, two different approaches. I know one guy who says, we keep all the code in our GitHub, in our repository, and then you get it after you pay. I know another one who says, no, you set up the GitHub and we code against yours the whole time. We never hold your code hostage. Two different approaches when the customers are the same kind of customers and the agencies are the same kind of agencies, yet the internal values, the approaches that these agencies take are completely opposite. Well, what you're gonna discover is that one of these approaches connects better with certain kinds of segments and this other approach connects with other segments. So figuring out the kinds of customers that work best with you and that you work best with and that you're interested in will help you niche down, but it's gonna take work right? And you're going to have to do the work and then you're going to have to keep testing it and seeing, you know, what are we doing? What did we even do by accident? Simply because that's the way I always work. I never thought about it any other way. What are we doing by accident that we should do on purpose, right? And then once you start doing it on purpose, you'll start seeing customers self-select out and in, right? Because you just announce it on your website. We'll never keep your code hostage. We work on your GitHub repositors. And they're like, yeah, that's it. I'm signing up with you because I've been burned too many times with guys who are like, no, now I have the, now I have your code hostage and we're getting to the end. And now I want to change the price. Right. And so I don't like that stuff. And so you'll find the kinds of customers that you work with more and more as you start being more intentional about who you serve and how you do it. And speaking about being intentional of who you serve and being intentional of how you present yourself Something you're very intentional about is your conference, Cabo Press, and breaking the mold of conference retreats. And it's a highly curated conference slash retreat. So for listeners, Cabo Press is Chris's annual business conference in Mexico, in Baja, California. It's a unique experience. It's intimate and it's for leaders and applications are required and vetted, kind of like our GoWP copywriters and developers, for example. So I have a question around how you present this conference. So what was the catalyst for the an orthodox method of presenting this conference? So I had been to a conference in Chicago. I had gone in at, say, 8 in the morning. And the first session was at 8.30. And I took like three pages of notes. I had so many good ideas. This is going to be great. And then there was another talk at 9.30 and another at 10.30, another at 11.30. And then we had lunch. And then there was a two o'clock and a three o'clock and a four o'clock and a five o'clock. And by the time I was done at five, I think I skipped the last session. I looked at my buddy and I'm like, I'm, I'm done. I'm tanked. Do you want to you get to dinner early? He's like, sure. We left. I took that, that folder uh, with all the notes and I uh, tossed it in a closet. I was done, right? I'd spent all this money to go to this event. And I was wiped out. I had been in a room where people had talked at me for hours and hours and hours. And even the bright ideas I had at 8.30 or 9 in the morning, they had been choked out by all the other ideas and all the other initiatives and all the other things at the end. And even as you're listening to these ideas, you're thinking, well, I have a follow-up question, right? But I have no way to ask that follow-up question because they're just on to the next point and the point after that. And uh, it's in one of those, you know, hotel ballrooms where there's no windows and you just, you lose track of time and it, I was done. So a week or two later, 
it was family vacation time and we were at Cabo, my favorite place on earth. And I'm laying in the pool, I'm hanging out with my wife. And uh, I said, you know what? If I ran into a conference, I do it here. I do it here and I do it in this pool, like right here. She's like, you do a conference in the pool? I'm like, yeah. I, like the thing is my coaching, which by that point I'd been doing for years, right? My coaching is fundamentally at its core about taking something you're doing wrong and helping you do it right. But in order to tell someone they're doing something wrong, you have to bring all their defenses down. Because if you just look at someone and like, you're bad and wrong. And they're like, nah, I don't want to change anything. All our defenses go up. So I'm looking at this, you know, five-star resort in Cabo. And I'm like, Melissa, this would be the place. Like I'd hang out here and I would just bring the walls down. They'd relax. And then I could tell them how to do it. And I'd, I, it wouldn't be one-on-one right? Like, you know how you get to a point in coaching where you're like, I don't have any more hours, right? Like I, I can't scale this. And so this conference would be an extension of that. And, and it wouldn't ha just have to be me. I can bring other people. We can have conversations in the pool. We'll do the thing in the pool. We'll be outdoors. And by the way, we'll do just two sessions and then lunch and that's it. No overwhelm. No like, oh my, and by the way, they're conversations. They're not talks. So if you have a question, when someone says, you should do this for your market automation, and someone says, hey, I have a question, you ask the question, right? And so you dig into it. So that's how I spawned the idea. We ran it the first year, and I had no curation. I, I knew I would do all the sessions. I would, I would lead all the sessions and lead all the you know, conversations. But I did bring a couple of people to be hosts with me, right? And so I knew I, I got four smart friends who will be great. And then I just said, anyone who buys a ticket can come, right? Like, it, it just whatever. And one of the people that bought a ticket the first year laid on the lounge chair the whole time and never came to a session. And I was like, I was bothered, right? They came to lunch and then they're like, Ooh, I'm tired. I'm going to go get a nap. And you're like, tired. Didn't you take a nap all morning? Right? Like it was crazy. And then another person just kept doing this whole, like, I want to, I'm a million dollar business. I want to go to 2 million. But every time we gave them a suggestion, have you thought about this? They didn't want to change anything. And I'm like, nope, I need to do something different. So I implemented the application process for the very you know, second year. And from then, I have been really stringent on who comes and also who leads sessions. And it takes me about six weeks to background check without official background check. I'm not running government background checks, but to dig through people's tweets and Facebook and their blog posts. And then if, if you don't have that, I call other people. If you, you put logos on your website, like I've helped these businesses, I'll call those businesses because I know people there and be like, you ever worked with this vendor? How they do that? Like I grab a bunch of data that helps me know whether or not you're ready to come in. I say no to some people that then come back and say pushback, like why no? I'm willing to do the work, right? And so you, you have more conversation, but it's a highly curated base of people that come. It's also highly curated hosts. And uh, the net result is it works right? People walk away going, oh, I'm more willing to do a partnership with them, or I'm willing to do a deal with them, or I'm willing to do some co-promotion with them because I've met them. I know them. It's really good. Now, in every class, every alumni of Cobb Press, there's one or two people that I'm like, nah, I'm not inviting them back, right? That was a miss. But there's a lot of people that I think, ooh, I want to invite back. But you just can't, right? To keep the event at 50 or 60 people, we, we have now had more than 400, maybe 450 people attend. And, and uh, if you're going to keep alumni to say 25, you're picking 25 people out of 450, right? Like that's, that's its own challenge, right? So, but yeah, that's how we got there. And it works. You said it works. Um, it does work. And you have a great reputation to show that. I, and speaking of your reputation, you, you have the reputation of being a very busy man. So I know we're cutting close on time, but there are two questions that I just have to get out today and Joanne, the next question. And then the question about the children, I really want to, I want to in the future, I really would love to hear Chris's response to that. So this next round, you, we didn't give you a heads up on this, Chris, but you did a great job earlier with the 90 second um, explanation of the bridge framework. This next round, this next question is a quick flash round. Everybody who knows you and knows your style knows that when Chris Lama is relaxing, there's usually a cigar in his hand. So the next question that I have for you is just a rapid response. You don't have to think about it. I'm going to give you two names. Uh, and these are all individuals who are famous, alive and dead. I think actually, I think they're all dead. But anyway, they're famous people who are uh, known for their cigars. So just 
your reaction in a flash who basically who resonates with you the most first one winston churchill groucho marx churchill he put a safety pin a t-pin in his end of the cigar so it would ash and ash and ash and ash and yet as he's walking around you got aides who are running with a little <laughs> plate underneath and they didn't know that the t-pin was in there holding it and so they're all like ah and he's just having a blast while he's smoking and that's my kind of guy still funny different than groucho but i, I love churchill yeah that's very churchill that he would do that next thomas edison sigmund freud oh wow edison because he focused on experimentation Try and try and try again. I only need to make it work once. I think everything, everything is about experimentation. So yeah, that's where I go. Next, Tony Soprano, Al Capone. Oh, wow. I, oh my God, we I, did I, it, I Mariah. I don't, yeah, I don't know if I can answer this while being recorded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think Al Capone, because he's real and Tony Soprano is a character. Peter Falk, AKA Columbo, for listeners Columbo. who don't know Peter yeah. Falk, uh, yeah. or Archie Bunker. Oh, easily Peter Falk. His, you know, he has a narrative arc in everything he's doing. And he's like, one more question, right? And you're like, where's this going, right? So yeah, totally. Next, Mark Twain, Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock. And last, General George S. Patton or Babe Ruth? Patton, every time. If you haven't seen the movie Patton, which is a super long movie, and most people don't watch long movies anymore, it is one of the best flicks out there. And it really digs into his character and, and you know what he was about. Um, he got embroiled in a little bit of controversy when he was a uh, general. But you watch like how he, you know, takes care of the pearl gripped pistols, how he, you know, prays at night for weather, how he stands and leads that team, Patton, every single time. General Patton. I believe that's the George C. Scott version, I think. Yes. Uh, is the one George he won C. an Oscar for, I think. Is, yep. Awesome. And last question, Joanne, do you want to hit Chris with the family question? Yeah. Yeah. So you have two teenagers. I do. After all of the things you've told them over the years, whether they truly heard you in the moment or not, what is one lesson or story that you hoped they hold on tight to their for the rest of their lives? Well, I know it stuck, but not in the way I intended, but I think it will still bear fruit. My daughter was five or six and she said, dad, I have a business idea. You know, we are business people here in the house. So that's not shocking. And she's wise beyond her years. And so she's five or six. And she says, dad, uh, maybe six or seven, but she says, dad, I have a great business idea. I'm going to make a newspaper and uh, make it with cartoons of topics of around the neighborhood. And then I'm going to sell it to the neighbors. And I, without missing a beat, I said, that's the stupidest idea I've heard. And she's like, what? I'm like, first of all, newspapers are dying, right? So you, like, there's no way you're going to sell people on newspapers. Second of all, you don't know what's going on in the neighborhood. And third of all, you really going to create comic strips more than once. Like you're going to do it the next week and the week after that. Like you can't set yourself up for something where you're going to fail. It's a bad idea. And I ended by saying, it's my job to make sure, and I do this with my customers too, to make sure that I kill your bad ideas fast so you have enough space to invest in your good ideas. You come up with a good idea, I'll be there to back you all the way, but that's a bad one and you need to kill it quickly. Now, she was six, she's now 16. She's graduating from high school. She's been accepted early acceptance to Houston, University of Houston. She's going to go to school next year and she's on her way to being a woman. And she still says, dad, remember when you crushed my soul and told me that I could, that that newspaper was a bad idea. So I know she's remembered it. Right. But what I hope she remembers from it, right. Is not every idea is a good one. And we have to run our ideas through filters and figure out which things are worth investing and which things aren't. And her dad will be there to help her with that for some period of time, but eventually she's going to have to do it on her own. And it's the most critical thing she can do to be a success is she needs more at bats. She needs more tries, but she only wants to try on the good ideas. She needs a filter to kill the bad ones quick. And that's why you are an awesome father to her and go WP's awesome learned uncle. <laughs> Thank you so much. A callback. See my callback. Look at that. I see. We, I see. Close we did it. Perfect. We closed. That was, that was so, that was fantastic. Mario, great job. No, Chris. I, I, thanks. 
Chris and Joanne, it was a wonderful conversation. And if you, for listeners, if you'd like to know more about Chris, you can read more about his many services at chrislemma.com. Yes, Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us today. We appreciate everything you do, whether it's when you join us in the happiness hours or so graciously joining us today for recording this podcast. Any closing notes? I I think that was fantastic. (laughs) It was my pleasure. And anytime you want to chat, I'm happy to. It's why I hang out on the GoWP uh, Facebook group and and the Friday hangouts, because it's a great time to connect with your audience. It's a great time to connect with leaders in the agency space. And it's the place other than this podcast where you get access to me and ask questions for free instead of paying money. So I highly recommend if you're an agency owner that you check out our Friday afternoon stuff. And if not, you can find me at chrislemma.com. You can also find me on Twitter at at Chris Lemma. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And you can get this podcast and every other episode of the GoWP Digital Agency Owners Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And just as a quick reminder at GoWP, we want to help you become more profitable, whether it's by listening to our podcasts like this one or joining in our weekly happiness hours on Fridays, viewing informative webinars hosted by our friends, for example, like Chris Lama in the WordPress community. And of course, by growing your team with our skilled developers, copywriters, designers, or project managers, go to gowp.com to read more about our services and to schedule a call. Thank you so much. We'll see y'all.